Great. We are back live here in uh, what's well, formerly sunny Las Vegas, Jeff. It's not sunny Las Vegas anymore. Stormy Las Vegas. I've just seen, checked the Twitter feed. People are saying there are uh, flood advisories, so everyone take care of yourself. Watch out for small pets and dogs. Um, so I'm Jeff Frick with Silicon Angle. We're here at Splunk Comp 2012. We've been going at it all day. A lot of really uh, interesting companies that are using Splunk to change the way they do business, getting a lot of data out. You know, not, not just data anymore, but really information, actionable information. So it's a lot of excitement. I'm here with my, uh, my co-host, Jeff from Wikibon.org, the uh, preeminent big data analyst in the industry. Is that what a- Well, that, that's what- that that's accurate, what, I uh, won't dispute that okay, if you want to so. say it, but. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Jeff uh, Kelly. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, having a great day here at .com. Uh, thanks, of course, to Splunk, our sponsor, for bringing us here, uh, letting well, us give you this great content. Uh, we've got another great guest. Uh, we've got Ken Cheney, Chief Revenue Officer, and Jeremy Latras, Co-Founder, CEO, Message Bus. Welcome, guys. Yep, thanks. thanks. Welcome to the Cube. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> thanks for having us. <laughs> so you guys are, we're telling us a little bit before we went on, you guys aren't just a, a Splunk customer. You kind of run your whole business with Splunks. Tell us a little bit about what you guys do and then uh, we can kind of dig into some of the details. That's right. So Message Bus is a uh, cloud native application that provides messaging services across email, application push notification, and various other message types that you could think of that, that branch out into the entire uh, world. <clears throat> so uh, we send lots of messages for various different customer types. Some of these are you know, receipts for financial transactions or password reset notifications. Others are marketing messages or newsletter notifications. Um, and they have different sort of tiers of priority classification and things like that. So we do that for a broad range of our customers. Um, we have uh, relationships with our customers based on their volume. So uh, one of the key ways that we've implemented Splunk initially in our company, uh, outside of the normal sort of um, you know, IT monitoring and, and no mm -hmm. notification filtration, things like that, is that we uh, allow our customers to see into their billing profile on a regular basis and actually correlate charges directly to log lines coming straight out of the machine code that's being generated as we send their messages. We can see not just the billing information as well, but we can also see response codes from uh, feedback loops that are subscribed to, and, and also we can see full stream information, uh, message by message, uh, user by user, so that they can really do a deep dive on the data at their, on their own time whenever they want. We also give them canned reports, which come straight out of Splunk. Um, but those are some novel ways that we're using it. Mm -hmm. There are some other very novel ways that are. Yeah, I mean, it's the typical s customer type that we're dealing with uh, is pretty comfortable with the types of tools like Splunk that we're using. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we encounter is that folks are actually looking to remove CapEx from their environment, okay. right? And so they come to us and uh, we allow them, if they're an app dev, to quickly bootstrap that app and get it up and running uh, with messaging services. Uh, or an enterprise who may be sending, as he was saying, you know, critical announcements, things like that. But but the point being is that is that at the end of the day, you know, these customers, when when they interact with us, uh, we're at they're actually you know, we eat our own dog food. We we leverage Splunk heavily across multiple business processes, and we expose where appropriate to our customers the information that Splunk provides. And like you said, so as folks are trying to reduce capex in the 21st century sort of right. compute model. They all want to get away from owning their own servers, from owning licenses for software that they'll go put on a shelf somewhere. Uh, and when we started dreaming about how we were going to provide a cloud native application to folks, we knew that we had to be in multiple clouds. So one thing that's kind of interesting to talk about with, our, with regard to our Splunk story, as well as just our general business story, is that we have a presence in every major cloud provider in their public cloud. And then we also have uh, various types of private cloud and hybrid um, pieces to our own business. So we're in Rackspace right now, we're in Amazon, we're in Joyent, we're working with the Azure crew to figure out how we best fit into that, um, that environment. But that allows our customers to be, to choose their own provider, mm -hmm. and we're right there native to that. Okay. Now, how does that play into the Splunk story? Well, we have a Splunk instance in each and every cloud. And, you can imagine that collecting data in each cloud and then trying to figure out how to piece it all together is a pretty difficult thing. But it's so simple with Splunk because we just say, okay, these are your forwarding nodes and this is your master node. And we can do a, a, a master node that's actually replicated in each cloud so that every cloud gets everybody else's roll-up data, not necessarily the deep dive, mm -hmm. but there's enough data there that you can go back and figure out sort of the important pieces of your business across the entire 
uh, logging infrastructure and across the entire data collection infrastructure. So, uh, yeah, I was going to say, there's just, <clears throat> you go out there, there's not that many vendors out there yet who are really delivering kind of truly cloud native application services. Right. And when you start thinking about running across multiple clouds, it's, it's a, it's an issue of not every cloud is the same, right? right. If you look across Rackspace or Joyent or AWS, uh, and you have specific strengths and weaknesses, so it's not that your workload is running, you know, spread evenly across those clouds. You actually are leveraging mm -hmm. the strengths within each, right? And so our Splunk deployments are really, as you point out, you know, you, you dive deep um, when needed for troubleshooting, but we aggregate kind of key critical metrics across that let, let us understand the total workload that is, is across all those systems at any given right, time. Right. But uh, you know, at any given time, uh, different parts of our workload are sitting in different spots. Right. So are you delivering across those multiple clouds because your customers are distributed, some in cloud A and some in cloud B, or are you actually delivering kind of the cloud-specific benefit to that customer it's during both. that process that they're, that they're executing and shifting that work appropriately? So yeah. it's both. And, and, and third, it's, it's utility or cost. Right. Right, our ability to leverage, leverage, depending on the type of workload, the advantages of each particular vendor. Oh, spectacular. So you, yeah. so you can imagine that your customers want you to be sort of native to their environment, just de facto, so you ha right. can feel their pain and sort of mm -hmm. get in there. Uh -huh. Sure. So that's great for us. Um, second, when we're going out to our customers and telling folks that we want to help automate tough business problems for them, we can prove that we know how to do that because we've automated the entire process of going to multiple clouds is 100% automated on our side. We use uh, Ops Code Chef to, to manage all those uh, different pieces for us. Um, so we can prove it right there. So that's the first one. The second one, survivability. If one of our cloud providers has an area locate or like a geographic uh, outage, Event. we don't have to participate in that, right? We can, we can bounce <laughs> workload over to another cloud or another geography based on what's available. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, what's fastest, what's most cost effective, that's the third thing, right? So what's most cost effective is often not a question of whether or not they've got high speed IO available in AWS today, right? With a, with a quality of service guarantee and an SLA and blah, blah, blah. Right. We don't necessarily want to have those conversations all the time, and we don't really want to think about what's most cost effective all the time. We do on, in very specific occasions. So we can set up relationships, long-term relationships with folks to get the guarantees at the best cost where it's actually important to us and not just sort of, you know, on an app, uh, on an across the board basis. Right. So, but um, to, to tie, tie it back to Splunk, right? Mm -hmm. Splunk's giving us that visibility from right. the, from a utilization perspective, right. uh, and we're able to pull kind of key metrics out. Right, so you know, in this world with, with that much data, you're, you're in hybrid environments, you're working across clouds, so you've got a lot of moving parts, a lot of data coming in from different sources. So you know, prior to a tool like Splunk, would it be even possible to do what you guys are doing? Absolutely not. Um, it, one of my favorite experiences at Twitter was actually finding out the hard way that uh, when you get to the high hundreds of machines, you lose all capacity for introspection. So when you want to introspect all the way down to which disk drive is going to fail, mm -hmm. <laughs> at 500 machines, you can't really do that, that type of introspection. The, the data volume rolling off the machines is so high, and there is so much noise, you can't detect any kind of signal at all. Uh, it's just a bunch of jagged graph lines that all confuse you. So, so no, we feel like, uh, Additionally, the fact that you can do all these natural language queries against Splunk data and against machine data and get back really effective information. That's one of the things that, that we, we presented here earlier today. One of our use cases is that we have uh, customer questions that normally would require a developer to try and answer. We have account managers who are not technical people who don't write code for a living, who've never written a database query in their lives, and they assemble and create their own Splunk queries to save, make their own dashboards and dashboards that they share with customers without ever interacting with a developer. Wow. So very technical interactions with no technical uh, knowledge required. Uh, those kinds of things are absolutely not possible in a, right. in a syslog world, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, tell us a little bit more about, uh, let's dig into some, some really kind of unique insights maybe you guys have, have uncovered using Splunk and some, some of the things, uh, you know, add some real color to, to how it's really translated into business value for you and your customers. Yeah. Sure, so we have... Uh, but, well, maybe we should cover it from like a process perspective. Sure. Like if you look at it from a life cycle perspective, we're using it across our life cycle. So um, our developers are trained up 
and uh, are actively uh, uh, leveraging Splunk to help us from an application testing, application troubleshooting perspective. So um, uh, in terms of how we instrument, so we're leveraging essentially key value pairs uh, to throw alerts. So uh, you don't actually have to have uh, you know, English language mm -hmm. written in there to throw those alerts for us. So, um, so we're leveraging Splunk heavily in that kind of dev test cycle. Okay. Actually, in our integration tests. So as we deploy new code, our integration tests go and run the new code through with a bunch of test data, and Splunk provides all the feedback from that test. And this, what's important here is, and you know, we, we should have backed up and covered this earlier, but we are a true agile DevOps environment, hmm. OK? Um, our developers sit with our ops folks, right? And some of them are one and the same. They're interchangeable people. Right? Yeah, yeah, interchangeable. So, um, so in terms of how we use Splunk and think about Splunk, we do think about it from a lifecycle perspective. Right? We think about, you know, as you're coding, how what you're coding is going to impact our operations. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, that, that example we gave about how we're using it for unit testing, how, mm -hmm. how that translates over then into production, right. it's all very real. We also use it to uh, measure the velocity of our development team. So we uh, kind of carry the uh, agile ideal of, of velocity around as a, as a number of complexity points that are developed or that are delivered to the production um, site or the production application in a week. And that gives us some, some time to introspect and figure out whether or not the features that we're trying to deliver are likely to occur in the next week or two, mm -hmm. right, or should right. we push that delivery right. date out and, and that's actually gleaned from the, the, the code check-ins that happen. There's a, there's a log analysis uh, that happens via Splunk at our GitHub. Right. So it provides right. us with graphs that are, uh, that are relevant to our operations. So we've got the coders, we've got the account managers, and then, of course, it's this, the same story everyone wants to tell you about their IT implementation, right? right? Where right. we didn't know the machine was going to die until we saw this spike, right? right? Uh, and we've actually got that set up in such a way that we'll actually receive, you know, pages to a mobile phone if things go horribly wrong, right. um, and that's all done with canned canned scripts. So I have two questions. Sure. We don't have a ton of time, but one is I'm just curious what the business value is that you've been able to extract through all these processes. The fact that you can build a company, so you guys are getting paid. Um, your investors are going to want to get paid at some point in time, and you must be saving your your customers money on the front end. So, I mean, what type of, a, of an ROI um, value proposition can you go into your customers if they switch their messaging yeah. or portions of their messaging yeah. platform? I mean, this is, that's a great question, right? I mean, the, the the market today that we compete in, uh, the the vast majority of customers out there that we talk to are deploying on uh, hardware where they're capacity constrained, right? So they have a huge amount of CapEx that goes into it. Along with that, there's a tremendous amount of expertise that has to be, has to be uh, part of the equation to under, understand email, understand messaging in general, manage the relationships with all the big receiver ISPs. Uh, and uh, we remove all of that, right? And Splunk lets us remove all of that, right. right? It is an enabler to our business, right? It's core to what we do. And, um, uh, and so, you know, for customers who come to us, you know, they're able to easily move their existing messaging traffic over to us. They're able to support new, exciting applications. So we work with a lot of social media, game developers, other types of companies like that who are looking to do very interesting types of use cases. They're able to do that very quickly with us, and they're able to ensure the deliverability, meaning it's one thing to just catapult messages out, right, it's another right. thing to actually make sure messages are delivered. Right. And you know, to that end, across our business, Splunk is helping with that, right? So if there's message problems, we know. Right. Splunk lets us know. Right. Right? As close to real time as possible. Yeah. And the question, the, the answer you're really looking for is that when we talk to customers who know a lot about the actual sunk costs that they have in sending large volumes of messages or just 
how important it is to their business as a bottom line value, they're looking at between 60 and 70% CapEx savings just by switching to this because you don't have to buy the machines, right. the network bandwidth, the co-location facilities, and then the, the expertise, the humans to go and service right. all of those pieces. Right. So uh, it's, a, it's a significant amount of savings to switch over to our process awesome. and, yeah. and we would absolutely not have the capability to do that without the, the current iteration of, of software as it is now. The, the, the other question I wanted to ask, which is kind of interesting, that's really their Twitter background, um, is there's a lot of talk here at the show about machine generated data, right? Yeah. Log files and sensors and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Right? But, but clearly, at least from the outside looking in, the, the explosive growth, which may or may not be accurate, is in people turning into machine generated data on Facebook threads and Twitter feeds and this, that, and, and the other. So I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, kind of being there at ground zero in terms of zero to big, really fast and explosive, you know, kind of. You know, what, what does that really mean to you? What, what have you kind of, have you seen this thing go from nothing to giant? I'll tell you, I, the reason I built this business of sending email is because a lot of people thought that uh, Facebook and Twitter and SMS were going to kill email, and yet year on year, email keeps growing by tens of percentage points. And the reason is very simple. People want to have conversations, and they want to have relevant conversations, and there are various forms, various media to, to get your conversation out there. Right. And Twitter and Facebook are great ways to have various types of conversations, and email is still a valid form of a conversation medium. And so we want to uh, be part of that story and watch it grow. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We should it is mention, explosive. Yeah, you know, you're part of the founding team there at Twitter. So that's right. Tell us a little bit about uh, you know how you kind of transitioned from from your role there at Twitter to to this 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 job here, and how how did that kind of inform working at Twitter and and kind of the lessons learned there informed what you're doing now? Well, I didn't sleep for about four years. <laughs> so, uh, so it was probably time to take a little rest, but in 2010, so what better way than launch a startup, right? That's right. So in 2010, <laughs> I, I decided to get some sleep. I took a long sabbatical and decided that I just wanted to go do something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, about a year and a half before that, one of the people, we had an uh, open desk policy at Twitter when we first founded it, we had a bunch of people who rented desks from us. And one of those people was Narendra Rochelle, who was an original founder of WebShots. Great story there. He and his partner, Nick Wilder, were doing this incubator project, and they wanted me to come help them set up email servers for their incubated companies. And as we got closer and closer to automating that process, we realized that what we had was a multi-tenant cloud solution. And we said, wow, this might be something fun to play with. Um, we got roped into taking some funding from uh, True Ventures and made a real business out of it. Today we're up to 31 employees. We've got some great customers um, and some great stories. Um, my friends uh, that helped, you know, my friends that founded Twitter with me so. are now some of our best customers. Ah. So, um, so we're dealing with the obvious corporations, uh, company Lyft. Um, we're trying to work our way into Medium right now uh, with uh, some great folks there. They've figured out that, that email is now a important part of that. And we've we've got a bunch of other stories that we're going to be really excited to tell later this year. So, you know, our goal is the same the same way that people equate Amazon to CPU right. with mm -hmm. AWS, and they equate Dropbox or Box to storage, we want to be that for cloud messaging, mm -hmm. right? When people think about cloud messaging and, and the requirements around that, they turn to us. We're the messaging layer. Really, really interesting story. I mean, we're hearing some really great customer stories about yeah. the different ways. I mean, it, it just runs the gamut. The different ways customers of Splunk are using the tool, using the product. Uh, you know, startups. Uh, then we're seeing larger enterprises that are kind of trying to modernize the way they uh, they handle things. And yep. DevOps, you mentioned earlier. I mean, that's, we've heard that a couple times today about right. how Splunk kind of enables that uh, that more iterative approach as opposed to the old kind of a little more static siloed model. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay, right. And just really extracting enough business, enough right. business value to, to build the business on and give business value back to the customers and, and continue to grow and grow. Absolutely. Grow. It's terrific. Absolutely. Okay, Ken and Jeremy from Message Bus, thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Appreciate thanks. it. Thanks yeah. for coming thanks, on. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, John. <laughs> and we're, uh, of course, we're here at uh, .com 2012 Splunk's user conference here in Las Vegas. Uh, thanks to uh, Splunk, our sponsor, for bringing us here. Really appreciate it. Uh, giving you this great coverage uh, all day today and tomorrow. Uh, so we'll be right back uh, after a quick message.